before we start, instead of doing a one to 10 count for your audio, why don't you name five of your favorite Mexican spices for us? Mexican spices? I didn't even grow up eating spices. I'll give you like five Mexican chiles that I love. Love it. Can that, does that count? Yeah. Okay, let's do morita because I just made us made us also with moritas, chihuacles for mole, chipotle because who doesn't love chipotle, which is a cousin of the morita, jalapeño, which is a fresh chipotle, and maybe serrano because I just made a salsa with the serrano. Yum. Love it. You sound great. Yay. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Cappy and you're listening to Beyond the Plate. This is a podcast where we sit down with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey into the food industry and the social impact they have made in their community. If you're new to the pod, welcome. If you listened before, we're glad you're back. We hope this episode inspires you to cook or possibly do some good today as these chefs inspire us. And we're grateful to our partners who make this podcast a reality. With that... Guess what? I'm recording. What? You're recording? We're going to do this? Yeah, we're doing it. Great. Because this episode is brought to you by our friends at Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Hi, Ian. Hey, Cappy. Everyone, our executive producer, Ian, is back and has not left us yet. Well, as long as you keep sending me those Martin rolls and bread, I'll be in your life forever, Cappy. You really love those Martin's rolls, don't you? I do. I love the rolls and just the bread. I actually have it for toast every morning. Not joking. I have a little tip for you. Really? Yeah. Bring well, it. Well, I mean, it's what I do. I want it. Which is put two pieces in the toaster, get them almost how I like them, like almost all the way done. Take it out real quick, put a little butter on it. I know it seems logical to do this. Put it back in the toaster, but the toaster is done toasting. If that makes sense, still warm. Yeah. Butter melts perfectly. And then it literally goes edge to edge. Take it out. It just is like the perfect looking piece of toast. And if I don't have it to start my day, it's a terrible day. So have to do it every day. Two things. One, it's funny you said edge to edge because our former Beyond the Plate guest, Jeff Morrow, has a thing when he makes sandwiches that he says crust to crust is a must. Yeah. So you're going Good edge luck. to edge. I like it. Also, are you using Martin's butter bread? Because that may be like double the butter, double the fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've seen it on the shelves. I haven't uh, picked that one up yet. We've done the cinnamon one. And of course, I don't know how anyone eats a hot dog or a hamburger without Martin's. So uh, it's a joke in our house that don't don't bring me a non-Martin's roll for a burger or hot dog. But I'll try the butter on butter. Well, that's not a joke, Ian. You I know. must use it. Here's a little bit more on Martin's, everybody. They are an all-American family-owned and operated company founded in 1955 and headquartered in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. We just spoke about family. And what's cool about Martin's is that ever since Lloyd and Lois Martin converted their garage into a small bakery, yes, one of those business stories that started in a garage, they have focused on baking great tasting products using high quality ingredients and their dedication to excellence, quality, service, and family values is what sets them apart from their competitors and quite frankly, why we love them. They are the number one potato roll in America. And as I like to say, they can make almost any burger taste better. Also, as you know, it's very important to us here at Beyond the Plate that all of our partners have a strong sense of giving back to their community and Martin's checks that box. Their mission encompasses more than baking the best bread and providing good American jobs. They also believe in giving back to their community and the world around them. Through volunteering time and donating resources, they support hundreds of charitable organizations, such as food banks, after-school programs, disaster relief, and others that provide sustenance and comfort to people in need, both close to their baking facilities and abroad. To learn more about Martin's and check out some great recipes, go to potatorolls.com and follow them on social media at Potato Rolls. Martin's, we thank you. Thank you. One more thing. We have some awesome Beyond the Plate merch, which you can find a link to in your podcast player or at beyondtheplatemerch.com. Head on over and check out our hats, tees, and hoodies. Again, that's beyondtheplatemerch.com. Enjoy this week's episode. Today's guest is a CEO, chef, entrepreneur, teacher, Emmy-nominated TV personality, author, businesswoman, designer, and founder at Casa Marcella, and the proud mother of three beautiful children. She grew up in Tijuana, Mexico, later enrolled in Los Angeles Culinary Institute, and then moved to Paris, where she graduated as a classically trained chef at the Ritz Escoffier Cooking School. She began her professional career as a food editor for Bon Appetit magazine, then moved into television and began publishing a number of best-selling cookbooks. 
You've likely seen her on several Food Network shows, including Mexico Made Easy, The Kitchen, Best Baker in America, and Holiday Gingerbread Showdown, and a number of others. She's currently co-hosting a virtual cooking class with her sister Karina called The Marcella and Karina Show. Please enjoy this episode as we go beyond the plate with a woman who clearly does not know how to sit still, Chef Marcella Valladolid, or... Por favor, disfruten de este episodio en el cual vamos más a la del platillo con una mujer que claramente no sabe cómo mantenerse quieta, Chef Marcela Valladolid. Dude, that was really impressive. Did you like, do you speak Spanish or did you just write, did somebody translate that and you read it? A little bit of both. I <laughs> took Spanish for almost 10 years of my life, so it's like a hidden talent. Like I understand yeah. it fully and I started to write it out, but then I needed like a fact checker on my grammar. I understand. I only speak French when I drink and I hadn't, ha haven't had alcohol in three years. So it's been three years since I speak French. <laughs> you haven't had alcohol in three years. Yeah, I, I cut it out of my life. Let's start this off intense. I come from a long line of alcoholics. Fair. <laughs> I just wanted it to stop with me. It's as simple as that. Interesting. You yeah. made other interesting life, health, dietary, if you will. I feel like I've seen that you focus on like plant-based stuff too. Yeah, I've dabbled in at anything and everything. And that's, I think, why I have such a huge connection with my followers, because I've been really straightforward about an honest journey that has dabbled in like raw vegan, completely plant-based, autoimmune paleo. Like I've tried everything and I've posted about all yeah, of it. I love that. Okay. So clearly from your introduction, you've accomplished a lot. And I often ask this question at the end of a conversation, but given the laundry list that I just read, I'm curious, what would you like to do that you haven't done yet? Honestly, it, I'm just going to tell you the first thing that popped into my head, publish a magazine. Really? That's always been my dream. And people, and we had this conversation when you started, before you started recording, like, I can't do Kindles. Like, I need books. I'm still the person that buys 20 magazines at the airport because I'm usually at an airport without my kids. It's the only chance I'll ever get to sit with a magazine. I'll get all of them and I will read all of them on the plane. And that is like medicine for me. So for me, like every time I'm at the grocery store, there's at least 10 tacos on covers of American food magazines. There's always something Mexican. And there is no Mexican freaking like tortillas out sell bread, man. I think we can definitely take an all Mexican, like after Italian food, it's the most eaten food in America, ethically. So I feel like I need that Mexican food magazine. I think it's mainstream enough. And I, it's been in my head, I swear to God, for 10 years. So someday. I like that. I like that. Okay. So we're, of course, glad to have you as part of season seven of the podcast. And Congratulations. Thank you. We like to ask people about, the, we, chart, we start with their childhood. Their past often helps shape who they are today. So take us back to your childhood, to Tijuana, and how would you describe young Marcella or young Chela? Oh, I love that you said Chela. That was that's my nickname. That's what my friend, my very tight circle calls me. So, Cappy, you're familia yeah. now. You've been <laughs> baptized. You're one of us now. So, childhood. Yeah, I grew up in Tijuana with my mom and my dad. It, it's a very unique experience to grow up so close. Okay, so for those that don't know, Tijuana is the first city when you drive into Mexico from San Diego. So for the rest of Mexico, they're like, oh, in Tijuana, you guys aren't even Mexican. You're like half American. Because for those of us that live here and have the luxury of being able to cross the border back and forth, because many, obviously many people do not. For us, it's a region. There isn't a border. For those of us, like I said, that have, I'm an American born, so I have no issues at the border. It's literally like driving from neighborhood to neighborhood. Like I get in the car now and in literally 14 minutes, I'm in my dad's house in Mexico. Like I'm literally in another country. So for us, uh, it's like, what was it like growing up in Mexico? And I'm, well, it was almost like growing up in San Diego. Like for us, it's very, it's like, where are you? New York? I'm in Chicago, actually. Oh, Chicago. See, I don't know the neighborhoods, but if it were LA, it would be like driving from, I don't know, Beverly Hills to Brentwood. That's how close it is. So it's a super unique experience. Like we grow up in Tijuana with access to everything American. But if your family's Mexican, like mine at home, it's like fully, obviously Spanish, Mexican food. Mexican experience at the market. So I grew up literally, and then my mom or my parents, but mostly my mom for us to 
be able to fully speak English, they would put us in school in San Diego. So we would literally cross the international border every single day to go to school in San Diego. So I would get in the car at six in the morning with like my little breakfast in my Tupperware container. We would carpool because a lot, this is fairly normal practice for families in Tijuana. Like I would go pick up my friend Miriam and my friend Kuki and my friend Denise and my friend Claudia. My mom would be driving and then we would all, everybody had to have passport in hand. We would cross the international border. She would drop us off in school, probably spend the day in San Diego so she didn't have to cross the border twice, pick us up and then drive us back home. It's still common practice now. My sister Karina lives in Tijuana now, and her daughter Daniela will cross the border every day to go to school in San Diego. So for many families, this is common practice. It's mostly a private school education because obviously a, a child that resides in Tijuana will not get access to public education in San Diego, but it's quite normal practice. And that's how I grew up. And for me personally, I think out of all of my friends, and we're a big group, there's like 20 of us, I'm probably the one that has the least amount of accent, which also comes up probably only when I'm drinking. And like I said, it's been three years. So my Spanish, my English has been pretty good for the last three years. But I fully, it's one of those things, man, like, what do you want to be when you're a teenager? Not different. So for me, like, it was so important to like assimilate, right? So I've really got in high school, got into the language. I was much more open to having American friends. And when the Mexican, like Mexicanas, like it was a click and we would sit on our own little table. Like I really wanted to be a part of the culture. And I think that was instrumental in shaping my culinary career because I really wanted to be a part of this culture. But I was just, it was like DNA, like to be a part of the Mexican culture. So I, I feel like I'm literally split down the middle because of that experience. But growing up there was amazing. There were some crazy, I remember just a really traditional food childhood because this podcast is like food centric. What's great about Tijuana is we're a newer city. We're I think 120, 130, I don't even know, so bad. But as opposed to like Puebla and Oaxaca and like all those cities that have recipes and traditions that are documented from hundreds, sometimes even thousands pre-span of years. And in Tijuana, like we're a baby. So we have a little, and plus we have a lot of migration from people that come to Tijuana and want to make it into the States and eventually cannot do that. So we have people from not only all of Mexico, but like all of Latin America. So our food scene is a literal, it's very New Yorkish. It's a literal melting pot. And that's how I grew up with all those foods from all over Mexico. Yeah. That's really cool. What was in the Tupperware container on your way to school? <laughs> First thing they came up, like huevito con tortillas or migas, which is basically scrambled eggs with fried tortillas. And I would put ketchup and a ton of salt. Love it. Ketchup. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So like, what yeah. were you into as a little girl? Like, what did you do after school? Were you normal little girl things or were you into food? And No, I wasn't into food. Food didn't happen to me till very late in life. And from what I can't remember, because honestly, I can't remember that much. I was super duper shy. Like people thought literally that I was mute, that I couldn't speak when I was a little girl because I was incredibly, and I'm still sort of antisocial, but now I can pretend that I'm not a little better. But I was incredibly shy and I wasn't very social. So I didn't have a lot of friends. My, I was only comfortable with my family because we had a huge family. Like that, I think that, that's why I feel like I didn't need friends because I was always with my primos and there were like 20 of us and we hung out every single weekend at my grandparents' house in Tijuana. So it was a very family-centered childhood. Very. My grandparents had a huge house in Tijuana, literally called Casa Grande because it was big. And every single afternoon after school, we would go there. My dad wasn't around much. He worked a lot. So we only saw him like at night and like on Sundays because we had to have family Sunday. We'd go to church and then eat at a restaurant and then we would repeat. Like that was just the schedule with him. So we hung out with my mom and her side of the family and just at my grandparents' house. And that's where I fell in love with cooking a little bit later in life. Was there like a big dinner table, big family dinners at Casa Grande? Yeah, but it was mostly, I love that you said it in Spanish. It was mostly casual and in the kitchen. The house was set up. It's crazy because the house was set up where it had a traditional kitchen, but it also had like a butler's pantry and it had like a massive dining room for formal events. So like during the week, and honestly, most of the year, it would just be casual around like the kitchen island. Like we rarely, they rarely set the table. But when it was like Christmas or Thanksgiving, because we celebrated the American holidays in Tijuana as opposed to any other city in Mexico, we celebrated Thanksgiving or a wedding or an engagement or a baby shower, something big, they would set the dining room table. And my grandparents had a shop in downtown Tijuana where they would import a bunch of French like antiques, just anything from like tableware to furniture to marble. So there was a huge marble statue of a naked man. It was, we had giggled when we were kids. It was like, the David, but it wasn't the David. 
And my grandparents' house was like a formal, they've remodeled it now. Uh, they obviously passed away, but the house was ridiculously gorgeous, very French, very traditional, super fancy. My grandfather was the Mexican consulate of Belgium for many years in Mexico. So he traveled extensively to Europe and he was obsessed with Escoffier and Poin. Oh, he was, obs- he, he collected every single, that's what was so huge when I was hired at Bon Appetit magazine. He collected every single issue of Bon Appetit magazine since it was a booklet in the fifties. So he, and back in the Bill Gary days, like they cooked like that. It's not like now, like they cook like that back in the day in Bon Appetit. So we ate from Bon Appetit magazine, like at those fancy celebrations, like all the time. So the meals weren't all Mexican inspired. Oh God, no, but he would use Mexican ingredients and we would definitely celebrate gozadas when we had like tamales, his his menudo, pozole, like all of that happened. And sometimes it was mixed. Most of the times it was not, but many times like the turkey lived next to the tamales on the Thanksgiving table. But he was a purist mostly when it came to like traditional French cuisine. He like cured his own meats, like beef wellington, like il flottant, like he did all of it. He was awesome. Really excellent cook. Did mom or dad cook? Dad was a macho or is a macho Mexican and those don't cook. They don't. They, it's like a thing. My dad only went in the kitchen for his saltines and sour cream. That's the only thing that he would make for himself, literally. Or he would open like a can of canned oysters. Like, that's all I remember him. Like he was un, I still, to this day, I don't know if he can't cook or chooses not to cook. I've never seen him in my 43 years on this earth, I've never seen him make a put together food that isn't like never, not once in my life. Your grandfather cooked. But my grandfather was on my mom's side, different upbringing. My father's, no, my father's father was like him. And he was actually like one of a general in like the Mexican revolution. Like, no, those guys, these men don't cook. The women cook. Yeah. Interesting. So when did you start becoming interested? Did you ever cook at all as a kid or did you have any interest? It was, well, it was a huge part of my life. I think it was just a part of the upbringing. My mom, she had hep C and thyroid issues and heart issues, blah, blah. So she spent a lot of time in bed. And my dad, like I said, couldn't, he would starve before he went into a kitchen. So he literally stole the cook from the place where he played golf in Tijuana. His name was Pedro and Pedro lived with us for 10 years. He's like a family member. Like I still see him. Pedro's like, he's like my dad. He's like my second dad. And Pedro cooked for us every single day. And Pedro have had lived all over the Mexico. So he's the one that really introduced me to the different cuisines of Mexico. Obviously, we traveled extensively through Mexico, but I was a kid. I wasn't paying attention to what came from where. And when I was a little older, Pedro, he just became the instrument that got me excited about cook. He was just the type of person that would make a quesadilla, but it was the best quesadilla you've ever had in your life. Everything, like a sandwich, like a ham and cheese, everything he made, his sazon was incredible. Everything he made was amazing. Like after that, and I think that's why this is important. It was like a pivot where I had no interest in eating any place else and was always super excited about coming home to eat. And that's, I think, what has shaped my style of cooking. I need people to prefer to eat this food than to eat out. And for me, it's a home run because Philip, my partner, will be sitting at the table and he'll be like, you can't get this in a restaurant. And I'm like, home run. This is a good one. And the kids will say, David will say it too. And like, that's just been the goal. And that came from Pedro that I would literally be out with my friends partying. And I'd be like, oh, I want to get home to Pedro right now. That's so funny. (laughs) Okay. So you mentioned mama who's in heaven now. Do you have recipes of hers that help keep you, your family connected to her? Very few. Like I said, she didn't cook that much. She did make a strawberry tartlet that I've cooked a million times on my shows and it's published in one of my books. And that is literally like she uses Dream Whip to make. Let's be a hundred percent honest here and that one is incredible like even my friends remember that one like to this day like I'll be invited somewhere and my friend Miriam will be like can you bring the pie can you bring your mom's pie we had an uncle that would literally cross the border because we had an aunt here in San Diego and my mom spent a lot of time with her later in life and when she would make the pie in San Diego my uncle would literally drive from Tijuana to San Diego like just to eat the tartlet so that's a big one yeah she made an incredible guava cake it was mostly dessert now that I think about it she made an incredible incredible guava cake because we had a guava tree outside but she of course she made it fancy because that's what my mom did she made everything fancy and beautiful and it was a layered cake with a custard guava filling and like royal icing and everything she made was just like next level chipotle spaghetti which 
Pedro actually made, but it was like my mom's. Like Pedro didn't make anything that my mom didn't approve of because she would be in bed, but she would be like, make chipotle spaghetti. And then Pedro would have to figure out chipotle spaghetti. And she would like critique it. Oh my God. And she was horrible. She was like, send it back. <laughs> she was horrible. I love her for it because she could, she was not able to fake something that was not, that she's not feeling. I love that. Okay. So after you completed Los Angeles Culinary Institute, I mentioned you moved to Paris. Mm -hmm. Tell us, I want to hear more about that journey and any bumps in the road, like throughout that time or memorable moments for you. Oh gosh, many. Can I tell you the truth? I had no interest in becoming a chef. I was an architect in architecture school. In, in Universidad Iberoamericana, which is a good university in Tijuana, in Playas, south of Tijuana, about 20, 30 minutes. And I grew up in a really traditional, strict Mexican home where literally the plan was you leave here when you have a ring on your finger. So you go from me being in charge to whoever your man of your house is going to be in charge. And even in college, it was very strict. A lot of rules, a lot, and I, a hundred different reasons. I literally left and I said, I love you guys, but I'm literally going to let go of my architecture. That's how much I needed my freedom. So I left and I found a job as a hostess in LA in a restaurant. And my mom called and she's like, listen, and my mom was always super supportive. My dad was is just old school traditional. And my dad, my mom was like, listen, pick whatever career you want. Just like before you go out into the world and tell us that you're done with us and go look for your life. We at least want to gift you give you some sort of education, like some sort of certification, like some sort of something one year for like, just pick something like we want it, we want to release you, because it was literally like my liberation with something before you leave. And the prior summer, I had worked with my aunt Marcella, same name, and she had one of the biggest one of the first and biggest culinary schools in Mexico. She gave me a job and I adore her. She was always like my idol. She's 10 years younger than my mom. So I hung out with her a lot, like literally like at the club. I was with my tia Marcela drinking until 6 a.m. Like we were close, like we hung out and I saw her create this business and I, and I was a student of hers and then I was an assistant of hers and I absolutely love, she's my biggest inspiration in the kitchen, how she had such a powerful command of the cuisine and the culture and how she was able to take people that were so insecure about cooking and turn them into confident women is all women. It was 500 women. And I said to my mom to be, I was so put off by the whole experience of university because of the situation at home. I was like, I don't want to continue my, I was such a brat. I was like, I don't want to continue my architecture studies. I want to study food. And she was like, great, let's do it. And I was like, Thanks, mom. Were you scared to have that conversation with her? I was scared to have it with my dad, not with my mom. And I actually didn't have it with my dad. It was a few It was a few months before I even sat down and talked to my dad after that. Because when I left, I knew he was not, it was not going to be like, my mom is fine, whatever. But with my dad, it wasn't going to be an easy break. Like I knew I was risking him not wanting to speak to me for, or being very upset for a little bit. Eventually he was like, whatever. But it took, it was very hard at the moment. So the deal or the arrangement was like, we will pay for culinary school. And we will pay for your housing for the duration of your education. And then you're on your own. God bless. And I was like, yeah, this is an awesome deal. So I was really fortunate. I went to the Los Angeles Culinary Institute, which is honestly, which is a kind of crappy school. Like in the end, like I think the secretary ran away with the head chef who was married and they took the money from like last generation of students and they had to close down the school and a bunch of kids were left without a certificate. Like it was drama. But right when I graduated, I went and sat at Bonatti Magazine and they interviewed me and Christine Kidd was a food editor back in the day. And she's like, like, listen, and I remember her pulling out like my file. I'm looking for a file. I got a stack of literally a hundred. And Philip got me that the connection to that interview, by the way, 25 what? years ago. And now he's, yeah, that's crazy. I'll tell you about that in a second. But she pulled out my, my resume and she's like, out of all of these people, you are the least experienced, but you are the most excited. So you get the job. And I was Love like, that. And she hired me and I stayed there for four years. And to this day that probably like I've done a million things, but you brought up Bon Appetit or I know if it's because in my, it's in my LinkedIn bio, but that's the thing that we always, that folks always go back to because it's such a prestigious magazine or it was back in the day. That's so interesting. Wait, so when did you go to Paris? I did Bon Appetit. It wasn't even like my idea. The whole time I was at Bon Appetit, I was like, don't give me the dessert stories and don't make me test dessert recipes. Like even to this day, like my students will be like, can we do desserts in the class? And I'm like, nope, I don't like doing desserts. So we're not doing desserts. But I would for three years, I was like, don't give me the dessert stories. I don't want to. And I had the balls to say that at like, because I was 18. I was super young when I started Bon Appetit. 
But for me to be to Christine be like, honestly, like I don't I can't don't give me the dessert stories. I'm going to mess them up. Don't just don't give them to me. And she called me into her office one day and she's like, listen, you have great potential, but you need to be a well-rounded, like whatever you want to be editor, chef, cook, person, writer. You need to learn how to do pastry. And I called my mom and I was like, hey, I want to go to Paris. You want to come with me? Do you want to put me through like French culinary school? And she's like, you're going to this coffee cooking school, blah, blah, blah. Like it was all like everybody else's idea, to be honest with you. And I was like, no, it was my mom's do it. Like my mom just wanted to go to Paris. So she came with you. How long was that program? It was only a summer, but I was there for four months. And my mom was like, And I'm super chill. Like I was like, put me in. I don't care if I sleep on the sidewalk. I'm going to be in Paris. I don't care. She's like, nope, I'm going to get us a little apartment and I'm going to come with you. And I'm going to be there for two months. So I was like, dude, yeah, I'm in 100%. So that's how that happened. Where and why the change of heart? Like you had no interest in pastries and you didn't want to screw up the stories. But then all of a sudden you're going to like Paris, like to learn about it. Were you like screw it, I need to learn about it. I was excited to go to Paris. I had seen what the school looked like and I'm not dumb. Like it might've been like not my hugest, like my biggest area of interest or whatever, but I was, it was a gorgeous school in the, in one of the most beautiful areas of Paris. My mom was willing to get us an apartment close by. Nothing about it was bad. Of course I was super excited. Like it was the Ritz and I truly wanted to learn. Like I'm a very studious person. Like I love to learn things. I love to read. I love to try new things. If I'm not being challenged, I get bored very quickly. So for me, it was an opportunity to just to do something different and learn something different and really grow my career. I was really into my job at Bonapti. Like I really thought it was going to help and advance my career or whatever if I had, you know, more more knowledge under my belt. So I was very excited about it. Education, studying, and you're about to head into another graduation, no? Talk to me about that. Yes. I'm so I didn't go to college. So to to have my first college experience, even though it was online, be it Stanford, like I was feeling very good about myself. But it was a rigorous interview process to get into the program. They they have very and this is all information that's out there, but your company has to make more than a million dollars a year to be considered in the business program. And it's all about the top or more successful. And me and my little company, like they had people that were up in the billions. Like it, it was these really impressive, successful entrepreneurs. Like it's not, they ain't celebrities. These people, you don't know their names. Like these people are like. So this is just so everyone listening. It's Stanford's, it's called Scaling for Excellence course in partnership with the Latino Business Action Network. Yeah, LBAN. And it's seven weeks of intensive. You're basically working on your own business plan. And I was working on mine, which revolved around Casa Marcela Inc. and the stuff that we want to bring to the market, an organic food line and all the other stuff that are, that's currently on the site and the housewares and all the stuff that we're very excited about. But I called Beatriz Acevedo, who's a huge mentor of mine. She produced my first show, but she also created after that one of the biggest, the Me Too, I don't know if you, not Me Too, like hashtag Me Too, but Me Too, like in Spanish, M-I and then T-U. It's a massive platform, online platform that had all of Hispanic or Latin American content on it. And it was huge and she ended up selling it and now she's doing, well, she's just brilliant. But anyway, she, I called her because I needed some advice, like literally crying about something because I had an investor and it was a very confusing moment and I needed solid advice from somebody that was very successful. And I call her and she's a close friend and she's like, and it was about scaling the business. And she's like, you need to do this program. And you only get in with a recommendation. So she recommended me. And after that, I went through the interview process and I did the program and I didn't even know, like through the middle of it, we went through a family personal crisis. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this, but eventually I did. And I got my piece of paper and Graduation was supposed to be at the end of the month, but now with the world, how it is now we're doing it in March, but I'm very excited. Very cool. So my next question I wanted to touch upon was about mentors, but you mentioned her, which is fantastic. I love that. You competed in the apprentice Martha Stewart version in 2005. How did that happen? I was literally nursing Fal eight years ago. I was nursing him watching the prices. I remember this, like this moment in my house in Tijuana with my now ex-husband. Well, he was at work. I was by myself, but I was nursing and watching the prices. And that's all I did that first year of Fausto's life was watch the prices, right? And nurse him on the leather couch in my home in Tijuana. That's all I did that year. And an advert uh, uh, commercial came up for the casting because they were doing a casting call in San Diego for Martha Stewart. Now, and just like my grandfather collected all of the Bon Appetit magazines, 
my mom collected every single issue of Martha Stewart. So I grew up with a mom that was obsessed with Martha, obsessed. So I knew Martha well. So I told my sister about the casting call and I called her and I said, listen, will you watch Foul while I do this? And she was like, sure. And then the day came for the casting call. I didn't even tell my ex-husband about it because I was like, this is not going to happen. And Fausto, my baby, got a fever. And I called my sister and I was like, listen, I'm not going to go to the thing. Fausto has a fever. I can't leave. And she's like, Marcella, you're getting in the car. I'm going to watch Fausto. He has, he'll be fine. She had her, she, had, she already had a daughter. So she's like, I can handle it. If anything, like my mom was still alive. She's like, if anything, we'll get mom, like go to the casting call because you're going to get this. And I leave her and I give her a foul and she takes care of him through the situation, which ended up being nothing, obviously. But I went to the casting call and it was like 10 rounds of it, man. And then the callbacks and callbacks. And through this whole process, I never told my ex-husband. I wasn't informing him about it because I was like, it's not going to happen. And why do I even want to have a conversation with him about leaving for two months? Like, I, like you know what I'm saying? I don't want to have this conversation. But the last round was... The last, I think it was 50 of us before they narrowed it down to whatever it was, 10 or 14, I don't remember. We were to be uh, locked up in a hotel somewhere in the valley, I think, in L.A. And we would do just rounds of interviews or panel interviews. And Mark Burnett was there. And it was, and they called me like at midnight and they were like, you're coming to L.A. for the final thing. And that, even though I knew it was like 50 of us that were coming, I'm like, I was like, I'm going to get this show. So at midnight that night, I had the conversation with him and I was like, listen, so <laughs> I've been having these interviews. I've been going to these interviews <laughs> and there is a possibility that you have to watch the baby because how was the baby? He was one. I was like, you have to watch the baby for two months. And he was like, what the hell are you talking about? And we're really close friends. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And I was like, I just didn't want to get into it because I thought there was no chance in hell that we would even have to have this conversation. Needless to say, I got the show. And it, in Tijuana, where the, you have no idea, like it's a very small community. And it became this like huge deal. Like it was in the paper. They had massive viewing parties. It was like, it was a big deal. It felt good. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Wickles Pickles. Wickles is back, huh? They are, Ian. Everyone, our wicked executive producer, Ian. See what I did there, Ian? Wicked. Ian's in Boston, everybody. And funny enough, one of Wickles' lines of pickles is called the Wicked Brine. Oh. Did a little double entendre there with the wicked. It's got to be uh, spelled right, like pronounced, you know, phonetically, if you will. Yeah. Wicked. Have you had the Wicked Brine, Ian? I have not. You must. Okay. It's delicious. Yeah. Because Wickles is, well, Wickles is still stocked in my fridge ever since last season. I have new jars. But Wickles is a family-run business. Their pickles are made using a 90-year-old family recipe and packed proudly in Alabama. So they have two varieties. They both have a custom blend of spices and fresh ingredients. The first one, which I just mentioned, is the original Wicked Brine, which is a little sweet and has some heat. And then they have a dirty dill line, which is more of that classic dill flavor. They also have this new item called Wicked Hula Pickles, which I'm kind of curious about. I think they're going a little Hawaiian on us. I haven't got my hands on them. I think it's pickles, jalapenos, and pineapple in the jar. So hopefully we can report back on that soon. I don't know how you feel about that, Ian, but I'm in. I'm all in. Uh, I'm in to try all of them because uh, I use uh, a lot of their spreads on my sandwiches, like that spicy red sandwich spread. Yeah. yeah the best. So good. And their jalapeno relish I actually used yesterday. I made a version of a Nashville style hot chicken, but I made hot fish. Oh, nice. And Nashville chicken, they serve with a pickle. So I put their jalapeno relish on top of it. A plus. Did you send it to me yet in the mail or I'll wait on that? I huh? did not. Yeah. Okay. Here's what I also love about Wickles Pickles, everybody. Like our pals at Martin's Famous Potato Rolls, Wickles also believes in giving back to their community through donating food and other resources. They support various organizations, including food banks and community food programs, as well as disaster relief efforts. I know they've supported a really cool project called the Martha Project, which is a nonprofit that focuses on how to use food as a way to connect and care for the houseless in communities they work in. So to learn more about Wickles Pickles and their whole line of products, please visit Wickles wicklespickles.com and follow them on social media at Wickles Pickles. Wickles, we thank you. We done. That it? That was good. Any lunch? I'm hungry. My mouth's watering a little bit. Yeah, that was, now I'm starving. Okay, when did you turn or transform from this like shy, quiet, 
person into wanting to try out for this? Like, was there a... No, no, no. Yeah, no. This me being comfortable in my own skin is from like last year. <laughs> I, I would literally, I'm not going to kid you. I would literally vomit before I did television appearances. I hated it. You're so good at it though. You're very sweet, but I hated it. And, but I kept getting callbacks and I kept getting money. And I was just, and you know what I'm saying? And it was my job. Like literally for me, the whole TV thing up until probably the last couple of years was a job that I didn't fully enjoy. And that's just my truth. There were moments definitely when I was having fun, but it used to be stomach aches, sleepless nights before television appearances, before tapings. Like it wasn't anything that I, very hard to get yeah, out of. It wasn't an enjoyable experience no. like leading up to it. Did you ever watch yourself on TV? Like after you shot? Never until recently, I couldn't watch it because I knew that I was, that it was a persona. Like never, I could not watch it. And I still watch the old stuff and I'm like, oh my God. Is there anything, granted it was a little while ago after doing that apprentice that you learned about yourself? Well, you're always learning, but I think on The Apprentice, something that my sister pointed out on The Apprentice was my first like foray into like, that was like national, like I'd never done anything before outside of like, like nothing. And I actually on that show, I wasn't savvy about like, people watching me like they I was I knew nothing so I actually was Marcella in that show and if you find those clips like I'm very shy and very introverted you don't even know I'm in the show until like episode six because I flew under the radar like you have no idea but you made it pretty far right oh I came out I, I came out third I made it all the way to the end but the thing for me is that, and I realized this as, as naive and young as I was, that 90% of the people that were there wanted to be on TV. They were very excited about the TV opportunity. I could not possibly care less on TV. I wanted a job with Martha. That was the prize, a one-year deal at MSLO. I remember like crying in the bathroom because I wanted to go home and see my son. And the producers were like, can you cry on camera? And I'm like, no, this is not fun for me. And then I remember, what was his name? One of the producers who's still a friend of mine, I can't believe I blanked on his name, but I remember him knocking on the bathroom. He's like, you cannot cry in the bathroom. And I'm like, can I just have five minutes to cry in the bathroom? I hated the whole process, but I really wanted to work with her. Yeah, interesting. What three words would you use to describe yourself? I would say resilient, for sure. Stubborn and hardworking. And how do you handle challenges in your work environment or career? Gosh, how do I handle challenges? I think very, uh, como se dice en inglés? I think the word is like pragmatically, like I don't, I, I separate myself. I'm very good at detaching emotionally from things and people. That's not easy. Some people see it as a flaw. I see it as a gift. I can be very cold when it comes to like work stuff. So I can very easily detach myself from emotionally from a deal not being good or being turned down for a job or not selling out on a pro like whatever. It's very easy for me to detach myself emotionally and be like, next. So I think I, I don't let my heart get too much in the game, which is really hard because when they're passing on you for like TV gigs, they're literally passing on you. They're not passing on like your cake. They're passing on you. <laughs> so I'm, I've gotten good at like emotional detachment when it comes to anything that doesn't go well with the company or myself. I mean, this is me personally speaking. I feel like that's like not easy and a good thing in a way. I have a mentor in my life who whenever I bring up like something in my work or career, like one of the first things they always say is like, remove your emotional attachment to it. I'm very good at that. I'm very cold when it comes to like when people are like, we can't for the show, we're going to I'm like, okay, good. Thanks. Like, don't explain it like this. You know what I'm saying? None of that stops me from continuing to move forward. And I think it's also I've done a lot of like internal work a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And when you start to believe and honestly believe like at your core that things happen for a reason, it gets really like sometimes you almost feel guilty for not being so affected by like you feel guilty, like, oh, I should be more intense and I should fight for it more and I should go back and I should send them an email and I should send them some clips of me being awesome. But honestly, for me, I don't operate that way, at least not anymore. Like a no is no. And I'm like, God bless. Next. It's very easy to me to move on from failure and not get stuck in failure. And I think that's the only way. I like that. What motivates you every day? What motivates me every day? Like in terms of my personal or career? Because they're different. Maybe both. 
personal, it's got to be like, I think I realized in the last couple years that I don't need to work on my kids for them to be okay. I need to work on me for my kids to be okay. So that motivates me in terms of the decisions that I make in terms of what I do with my time, how I manage self-care, what I read, what I listen to. Like I'm motivated constantly by being a better me because when I'm in a good place, all of a sudden their issues disappear. So it's a little nutty how that works. I don't know if it's energetic or what I'm projecting or my filter changes if I'm in a good place, but I'm just unable, if I'm having a really good day, like I'm unable to see like when something is amiss, which makes you chill more as a mom, which makes them chill more. And it's just like this kind of domino effect. So my motivation is to be a better person because it makes me a better mom to my children and a better partner to Philip. And in work, the motivation has always been the same, which is to show people, and this is so general, but like to show people how awesome Mexican is. And I think that's, and that, that's just always been the goal. There's so many stereotypes and there's so many misconceptions and there's so many super cheesy approaches to food and culture and everything. That's the motivation. Fantastic. Is there a piece of advice or a lesson that your mother gave to you that you pass along to your kids? Not that that she verbally, like, we got a lot of that from my dad, but from my mom, I could easily tell you that what I absorbed from her that I'm barely getting into now is just being unapologetic about who she is. Because my mom was that person, which for us nowadays is, or me being on the U.S. side of the border is like, it's very easy. But now that I remember my mom being in a small town where, where that's difficult, there's gossip and it's a small community and everybody knows everybody, blah, 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 blah. And now I look back and I can see the courage it took for her to say, I'm going to do things my way with, in terms of my relationship, in terms of my kids, in terms of how I raise them. And I think that was instrumental in, in me and my sister Karina and my brother Antonio to being successful in our lives is that we had a mom that was just constantly that she wasn't projecting on us what most Mexican moms project on their kids because that's that can be very heavy. Interesting. You mentioned Mexico and its culture and whatnot and representations or misrepresentations. And I know you have a strong point of view about Mexico, its culture, its cuisine. Are these important factors you consider when you make a decision for yourself and your business or your brand? Oh, 100%. A hundred percent. Like everything we're doing, for example, with the Casa Marcela, you know how immense, like how much easier it would be for me to make stuff like in China or in, you know what I'm saying? Like there are rules that we follow here. There's a mission and it's everything has to be made in Mexico. Everything has to be made ethically. We definitely want to find products that can be mass produced, but it has to be done in Mexico. It has to be an accurate representation. If there are artisans or makers involved, they have to be given credit. There are definitely rules that I have set for myself and standards that I've set for the company that really show Mexico for what it is. But at the same time, and I've said this to my public before is I don't want the pressure of being a representative of Mexico because what I bring forth in my company and Casa Marcel and all of the products are a representation of me and my aesthetic. Like I have no interest in being your ambassador or I have no interest in, because that's too heavy a weight to carry. There's too much tradition and there's technique. Like I don't want to, I don't want to be in charge of the person that brings you Mexico. I'm actually bringing you, which is entirely different. I'm bringing you Mexico through the Casa Marcela filter. And those are two entirely, I think, different things. There are, obviously, there's crossovers, right? Because anything Mexican, anything that comes from Casa Marcela is made in Mexico. So whatever. But I've always just want, really wanted to be clear in that distinction because for me, it's a goal to step away from tradition in terms of, of aesthetic, in terms of presentation, in terms of how I cook my food. A lot of it is definitely traditional, but a lot of it is very California Mexican or a lot of the stuff that I choose aesthetically is far from maybe traditional colors and color palettes and textures and techniques than traditional Mexico. So yeah, I just want to make that distinction. Love it. You mentioned before it makes you so happy when you cook a dish and your partner Philip says, now this I could see in a restaurant or ordering in a restaurant. Better, better than, than a restaurant. restaurant. Why haven't you done a restaurant? Will you ever do a restaurant? No, No. (laughs) probably not. Listen, there's been so many offers throughout the year. They've flown me out to Vegas three times. It's constantly popping up. And the rule was before Philip and the babies, I swear to you, I I said this for 15 years or no, how many? 12 years. I will consider a restaurant when Fowl goes to college. 
because I know what it takes to own a restaurant. And then I had two more babies. So by the time those two babies go to college, I will be senile. The only reason I, the only way I would do it, and Philip and I dream about this all the time because he likes to cook more than I do, which is the irony in all of this. Oh my God, he's an excellent cook. Excellent cook. The kids love it when he cooks more than when I cook. Like he is an excellent cook. But what, another dream other than the magazine that we've talked about before, like in my mind, I take over an historical home here in San Diego, either Chula or downtown or one of the neighborhoods I love. And I convert it into a really small restaurant and retail space. Like I've, and I've been looking at spots throughout the years and I've talked to city about a, an historical place here in the park. Like I've been exploring that idea for my entire career but I've always just been busy and I know what it takes. I know that that's going to be, and that might happen in Europe, honestly, because Philip and I will both want to end up retiring there. So I might take over a very little cottage or a tiny chateau, turn it into like a pop-up Mexican, whatever place. There's a dream, but it's a very small 10 seater menu changes every day, obviously seasonal. The cheese comes from the goats outside. Love sort it, of thing. love it. Tell me about like, more about what you've been up to. We've heard a lot about what you've been up to during the pandemic, but more specifically, I'm curious about the the whole Marcella and Karina show. Listen, that whole thing was just like a way for us to keep, or for me to keep my sanity during the world coming to an end. And we did a live one day and I cooked chicken, a uh, Jacques Pepin recipe where he flips the chicken on its side to keep it super tender. And I did it with my sister who doesn't, can't, who's like my dad. Like she can't, she doesn't know how to, she can't put cereal together. That's how bad her cooking skills are. And it was, we got such a huge response from the live and the whole pandemic, Philip was like, or not the whole, but the beginning of it, he was like, you should do online class. And I'm like, no, I'm too cool for school. Like, I'm not going to do that. But we saw like his yoga teacher move his operations online. And we did the math and we're like, this guy's making more money now than he ever made in his life. And there's no overhead cost because what was he paying in rent in Brentwood? And now he's got a hundred students per class. He's traveling all over the world in pandemic and he's making, you can see how many students he has and he knows how much, how much he charges per class. And we're like, he's making a gazillion dollars right now by moving his operation online. So that made me consider it. But it wasn't until Selena Gomez had me on her show. They came and shot mid-pandemic. So usually when I'm shooting things here at the house, we're like, show you, what do you get like 20, 30 people, right? Like it's a whole crew and food set. They managed to shoot this, like they had it down to like a science or whatever. And with three people here and no food styling, I had to do my own because it was literally mid-pandemic last year. And the show was perfect. And that's what gave me like we asked Philip asked so many questions about lighting, sound, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that gave me the courage. After that, I called my sister and I was like, we're going to do we're going to try this out. And we launched the first one. And we were traveling the moment that we opened up the class. And within 24 hours, we had sold 500 tickets. And I was like, you know what, there's something here. And we just kept doing it and doing it. And now we're going into class 30. And we just sold 1,600 tickets, which is insane. This has become my biggest business ever. And I think it ha it's a couple of things. Obviously, they're getting in my heart and in my soul. I am a teacher. That's what I do. I am a teacher. Like the biggest, like you have no idea how many times on the Food Network, they would literally say, stop being a teacher and have fun. I'm like, I don't want to have fun. I want to teach. But I understand that I, I was the one that was in the wrong. I understand that when you're doing a TV show, you can't be looking down and like trying to teach people like how to make a perfect, like whatever, like you need to be, you talk to the audience, you need to be engaged and you need to be personal and you need to interact with the guest host. Like I was so hyper-focused on teaching and the other part of it was just me pretending to be personable because that's what the job required. So doing these classes, I was really able to cut that bullshit out because Karina comes in with all of the fun all of the music. She doesn't cook. So she asks the best and silliest questions. When I'm not feeling like talking, she'll jump in and she'll say something. And the students really appreciate how thorough the instruction is. They love that. And I love that they love that. I love that that's what this is about. Like these people actually, you know, give a shit that it's me and that I've done this and all the stuff that you read about before I, before we started this, like they are they, there to learn. And at the end of the class, we will get hundreds and hundreds of tags of perfectly executed food that looks like mine. And I'm like, ah, oh, like they got it. They learned it. I could tell when you reshare those on Instagram, like you're genuinely like happy that they made oh my that, God. you know? Oh my God. Like lights out for the show and they laugh about it now, but I will be in a corner just looking at the repost to make, because for me, 
step to me is a successful class. It's not how many tickets we sold or it, it's nothing. It's the, what happens the 10 minutes after lights are off in the kitchen and I'm starting to see all the reposts. Like I can tell right away. And it's always been pretty That's amazing. cool. You mentioned Karina. What three words would she use to describe you? Oh, she's my biggest champion. So she would say, she would also say hardworking because she says that often. She would tell you that I'm loyal because she tells me that often. And she also like often tells me that I have a huge heart because I feel like she feels like she needs to remind me because I sometimes don't feel that about myself. So she's constantly telling me that I'm a very loving person because I feel like I can be super cold in my relationships and my, in my interactions with people. Like, like I said, I'm in, incapable of pretending at this point in my life. So she constantly reminds me like, you're actually a very nice person. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> I was going to say, is she right? But she is right. No, I am a nice person. It just, listen, I was doing the math the other day. It takes me about seven years to let somebody in, in, into my life. And that's why I think I didn't realize this about myself until very recently. And it can be childhood trauma. Like we get into Gabor Mate, like we could get into it like for, for, for 10 hours, but I don't feel the need to resolve that. Like I'm okay with how many people are in my inner circle. I'm okay with how tight those connections are. I'm okay with the fact that it takes me a really long time to make a strong connection with people like I'm 43, I'm not going to change that now. So it is what it is. Wait, wait. what do you mean you were doing the math? Because I was looking at my recent relationships and the newer relationships in my life. Like the new, like I gave an example about my neighbor the other day. She's going to listen to me, listen to it. She's like, you're insane. But she has been my next door neighbor for eight years. And it's not unless until the, it's been the last few months that we've actually had conversations. And I'm like, I love you so much. He's like, I love you too. But it took, and there were no ill feelings. Like in the first seven, I just had no interest. And even with the people that work with me, like it takes a really long time for me to be in that space where I'm really trusting of an assistant or it takes a really long time for me. Some people immediately are able to make those connections. For me, it takes a really long time to be to feel like I'm in a safe space. Like I'm civilized. Like I can, listen, I operate like a regular human being. I, the world, I navigate the world normally. I go to things and I talk to people, but to truly let people like into my life, it takes yeah, a while. Got it. Okay. So a big portion of this podcast, as I mentioned to you ahead of time for Beyond the Plate, is all of our guests give back in different ways. It's one of the main reasons why we do the podcast to share with listeners how chefs, restaurateurs, food personalities, like what they do outside of the kitchen, outside of their restaurant, outside of a book, a TV appearance, whatever it may be. I feel like you've been active with a number of projects, organizations. But one thing, I want to hear about some of the different causes that you support or have used your voice for. But beyond that, I seem to find like a common theme about you, like in your businesses, and that's community. So I guess let's start with what does community mean to you? Uh, Everything. Whenever I choose to partner with any organization, like, and there's a place for everything, like, right? Like it's for me, I need to be able to see the end result of literally where the money goes. And that's why I always choose like local and smaller charities that rare, that don't get like national support. Like there's the massive ones that everybody talks about and posts about. And there's all this press and marketing behind those. And those are great. They serve their purpose in the world. But for me, I need to, whenever I partner, it's usually local, it's usually small. And I actually get a chance to see the people that are being affected by my contribution. I need to see it. I need to touch it. I need to be there. I need to follow up. I need to, I need to be a part of it in some way. So I've always chosen a lot of immigration issues. Education for the children in our community is huge for me. Just things that have to do with literally the people that are in this community. Like that's important to me. Are there any specific organizations you want to call out that we could draw attention to? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The one that I've, I'm on the board for the for the Proyecto Colibri, which means Project Hummingbird, which literally grants scholarships to Latino kids in the San Diego area. We've done a lot of work with them, which I really love. I've also worked, for example, this is a really small project, but it's huge for me. Like I said, I need to be able to feel it. The, we always at the cooking classes, I don't know if you've ever been, but not always, but in many of them, the celebratory ones, we have a mariachi at the end of the class. 
which is like a huge thing. We've done it like in Christmas and Mother's Day and Father's Day. And it was, it's like the most beautiful thing. And I always cry and it's like a thing. But in talking to the guys that have now become family because they've come over to the house so many times. But now they teach my kids like music classes, like it's a whole thing, like they're family. Now. In conversation with them, we're trying to get like a mariachi program running for the kids in Chula Vista. I'm like, dude, let me get on it. And we did a couple of charity events for them and they got a whole bunch of money and now they're buying instruments. Like that's the th- sort of thing that, that brings me joy. Like I said, there's, of course, it's so important to, if you've got the money, write a check for that massive foundation. Like there's a lot of work to be done in the world. But for me personally, it's those smaller organizations. So the mariachi program in Chula Vista is important to me. Proyectos Colibri, which is done in conjunction with the Mexican consulate in San Diego, is a huge one for me. This is about humanity, which is a much larger organization. I've done stuff with them in the past that deals with immigration issues across the border and separated families and all of that. So those are the three big ones, I think, that are on my radar right now. That's awesome. I love that. And I love hearing the different causes and why our guests align themselves with them, because I think it's hugely important. I think there's a ton, thousands of guests, potential guests, chefs, restaurateurs, managers, cooks, whatever. And like a lot of people ask me, they want to get involved and they don't know how to get involved. And you you may not have something that you're super passionate about today, but you may tomorrow, next week, next year. It could be anything. Teaching kids to read. And it can change. 100%. Totally. And it could change. And and it was actually like hard for me to agree to be on the board of the scholarship foundation. And I was very straightforward with them. I was like, Listen, I'm not good with commitments. I'm good with doing everything that I could do for you in that moment. And then I follow up. I make sure the kids are okay. And then the money is placed property. And especially with these smaller situations, like you just have to be a little more, more diligent. But I like to move from thing to thing. I like to find different organizations. I like to find different foundations that we're looking to do a charity event for a transitional homeless shelter for addicts. Like I like to... I like to move in different things and do different things. And I think for me, it's just knowing that I'm using my platform and my money, like all the beautiful things that the universe has awarded me with in the last few years and just share it. So whatever that may be, big or small, like as long as you're doing something good in the world, no matter what. I always say give what you can, whether it is your voice as you do, your dollars as you do, or your time as you do. So some people have a dollar, like that's not wrong. Like you don't have to be able to write a huge check. A hundred percent. And it doesn't even need to be smaller. Like I, some of the strongest, most life changing work I've done. And I know this because of the feedback has been giving my time, my time. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a check. It was my time to sit with someone and, and mentor or talk to them or motivate them or given some words of advice. And that's service. Like service can embody so many different shapes, you know, and sometimes my service, like when I'm too drained to think about partnering with a charity or I'm concerned about money and I can't write a check. Like my service is putting out beautiful content into the world and speaking beautifully about my culture. And maybe for a moment, that's my contract. That's my service. Like service is just, I feel putting good out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Let's do a quick speed round. Si, senor. Number one, what did you have for dinner last night? Oh my God. Raisin bran. With milk? Yes. Who has raisin bread without milk? You choke on that stuff. It's so dry. Name a smell in the kitchen you love. Oh, roasted poblanos. Mm, Name a smell in the kitchen you hate. Cumin. Really? It's my mom. I think it's psychological. She would yell from her room in Espanol. Dile a Pedro que no use el comino. Which was tell Pedro not to put cumin in the food because Pedro loved cumin, but my mom could smell it all the way up in her bedroom. So I think I just grew up with it's inherited. But do you like it? Do you not use it? I use it sparingly. I don't think I have any in my spices right now. Like if I'm testing a recipe or I don't know if it traditionally has cumin, because some of the traditional Mexican recipes do have cumin. So I'll be like eighth of a pinch, micro pinch. But no, I don't like it. What pisses you off in the kitchen? Like for me or in general, but uh, not clean kitchens, people not cleaning up after themselves or just walking into a kitchen that's not clean to work. What makes you happy in the kitchen? Oh, a successful recipe or pot good feedback from my family about a recipe. What actor is playing Marcella in a movie? Uh, is my Arakarian actress because I get That's that I good. look like her every day of my life. She's not, I know she's not like an Oscar winner, but if I told you how many times a day I look like Mariah Carey when I'm not being a hermit and I'm out and about in the world, I get it a lot. I also get, I forget her name that's married to Ashton Kutcher. Uh, Mila Kunis. I get her all the time. So I would take Mila... Or Mariah. Those are good. Yeah, I'll take either of those. Okay, so closing up here, everybody has their own journey 
today we've discussed See? yours and there are thousands of young women who are fans of yours, who follow you, who you inspire. What message do you have for those women who are hoping to follow in your footsteps? Or if you'd like my horrible Spanish again, and you could answer in Spanish and English, ¿Qué mensaje le tienes a otras mujeres que quizá quieren seguir en sus pasos? Okay, well, first of all, don't follow my footsteps. Create your own path. I think that's the most important thing. And I say this all the time because I do get, I want to do this like you. And I'm like, you don't understand. I feel the reason that I am successful is because I did nothing like anybody else. I definitely had mentors, definitely. But my goal was never to be be like somebody else. My goal was to, and I'm just figuring it out now, the goal should be to do the work so that you can truly find your authentic self because that's what's what going to bring you success. When you have the courage to just use your real voice and really display your taste. Like if you start to make food like mine or plate food like mine or speak like me or try to write books like me, that's not you. And people can smell bullshit. Like my advice would be, to work really hard to find your voice and to find your authentic self. Because when you are that person, who's your competition? Like how many Marcellas do you know that, you know, were born in San Diego, but raised in Tijuana, but across the border, but speak English and speak Spanish and worked at one of When you've hyper focus, and I did this once when I was a keynote speaker at my high school, I was so nervous about it, but I was like, how can I convey my message? And I literally wrote a list of the things that made me and I read it out. And I was like, this is what has built my career. Just Marcella being Marcella and speaking to these bullets. It had nothing to do with anybody else. And I did find courage and examples from other women, from Hispanic women, from my aunts, from famous people, whatever you want. But the work has been to find my true voice. And when I did, that's when things started to get really interesting. So that would be my advice. Would you like me to say it in Spanish, but faster? Yeah, you, yeah bring it. <laughs> but, but not a little more succinct. Okay, okay. Super fácil. Que mi consejo eh, para el éxito en la vida general, no nada más la, la, la vida profesional, es que tengas el valor o hagas el trabajo que tengas que hacer para encontrar tu voz, para ser auténtica. Porque para mí es lo que me ha dado mi carrera. O sea, tener el valor de decir... Eh, estos son mis gustos, esta es la manera en que cocino, esta es la manera en que vivo mi cultura, esta es la manera en que me comunico y me conecto con la gente. Eh, luchar y hacer el trabajo para encontrar mi, mi autenticidad es lo que me ha dado mi éxito, sobre todo en los últimos dos años, que es cuando he tenido más éxito tanto emocional, de económico, eh, de trabajo. Los últimos dos años han sido como ninguno de mi carrera, pero también han sido los últimos dos años donde más he sido honesta con quien es Marcela. Entonces ese sería mi, 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 mi consejo. No, no busques seguir mis pasos. Busca crear tu camino. Love it. Thank you. This was fantastic. You're I welcome. love it. And I love It's nice you to too. see. When did I see I you I was last? trying to think of that too. Probably. I don't even know. My, well, you came through Chicago. But I didn't. I wasn't here when you came through Chicago. Well, you look exactly yeah. the same, <laughs> Cappy. You're like you're like the Mario Lopez of food. <laughs> That's funny. This was great. Thank you. Keep uh, kicking ass out there with everything. It's so fun to watch. Well, God bless. Thanks again to Chef Marcella Valladolid. Find more on her at casamarcella.com. To learn more about Proyecto Colibri, Project Hummingbird, go to macproject.org backslash colibri mx. That's M A A C Project. Dot org backslash C O L I B R I M X. We'll also share a link to those websites in the episode notes and at beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media at On Kathy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is also on social at BT Plate Podcast. This episode was produced by myself along with Ian Cohen, Joel Yetten, John Petrosian. Our digital media producer is Sarah McClellan Me. Our music has been composed by Goldford. Find him at iGoldford. As always, special shout out to my wife, Katie. If you have a moment, we'd love and appreciate it if you could rate or review and subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Don't forget to join us next Wednesday for an episode of Beyond the Drink, our companion podcast to Beyond the Plate, brought to you by our friends at One Hope Wine. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy, and remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs>